high performance statistical computing panel where we discuss building a statistics community within supercomputing. Uh, I'm George Ostrakov. I'm from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and uh, also University of Tennessee. Uh, the session moderator. Uh, my background is in statistics. Uh, I have been involved with parallel computing and supercomputing uh, since uh, probably about the mid 80s when uh, the first Intel personal supercomputer, the IPSC, Hypercube, was just down the hall and I had a chance to play with it. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe things will come full circle and we'll eventually have uh, personal supercomputers as well again. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, apologize, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties in the beginning. Uh, we have a great panel with three statisticians and three supercomputing scientists. Uh, all of the panelists have some experience with both communities, both uh, statistics and supercomputing. And uh, okay, the panel session will begin with a five minute opening statement from each of the panelists. And after that, we'll have uh, a little bit less, maybe 45 minutes for, for discussion. And so I guess the first one would would be uh, I guess we can we can do things uh, out of order, and we can we can begin with uh, whoever whoever is ready at the moment. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go first. In fact, I, well, I there you go. Okay, you are there. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. had planned to to uh, show my video because I think okay. More so we, and, uh, I, I prepared it, so I, I think we share. can do that. I, I think the the AV tech person should be able to. I play think I can that. do it. I can run it. I share my screen. Or you can run it from your end as well. Um, I'll just play that. Hopefully, it's going to. You can see my slide. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll play it. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mark Jenton. I'm a distinguished professor of statistics at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology or Karlstein Brief in Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to make a few remarks uh, about high performance statistical computing in the next slide. If you're interested to learn more about my group and the statisticians at KAUST, here are links to our website. So first, my personal introduction to uh, HPC. Uh, before joining KAUST nine years ago, I didn't know very much about HPC, but I was fortunate in, enough at KAUST to meet Professor David Keyes, who is the director of the Extreme Computing and Research Center. And as a statistician, many problems involve matrices and linear algebra, um, such as computing inverse or determinant of uh, matrices, the Cholesky factorization, Show complement, and often those matrices are symmetric, positive, definite, or with some kind of structure. And I learned uh, from that uh, center that there are methods to approximate uh, large matrices with structure, such as tile rank approximation or high hierarchical matrices. Uh, in statistics, there's a field, there's a subfield called stat statistical computing, and of course, um, this is a, a very vibrant. Uh, subfield of, of statistics, but it's different from HPSC because really HPSC is looking at problem at a much larger scale and has the tools that uh, can tackle some of uh, uh, the challenges that come from computations in statistics. As an example of HPSC, here at Kaos, we developed this software, ExagerStat, to be able to perform just statistics at exact scale. So this, uh, this software um, allows to do simulations uh, of a large data set to uh, perform a likelihood inference on very large data set, either exactly or with some type of a matrix approximation. We can do Krieging, so spatial interpolation. We have um, univariate and multivariate random field model. We have space-time covariances. We can use mixed precision to further improve and speed up uh, the computation and 
memory storage requirement. We led a competition on spatial statistics for large data set that was possible due to Exagerstat. Uh, indeed, we could simulate very large data set um, exactly, and we could also perform exact inference. And so for many methods that use approximation, uh, we could look at uh, how well this approximation performed. For statistician, explainability and robustness are very important. Uh, indeed, statisticians don't like too much black boxes. They, they want to understand what's going on in the, in the box. And uh, statisticians are also interested in robustness, so, so why and when a method or a model works. For example, if one uh, method works on a data set, is it going to work on another one? Or what are the assumptions and under what circumstances the method is going to fail? So these are very important uh, questions. Prediction and uncertainty. So statisticians are interested in prediction, but uh, also compute associated uncertainties. And this often is to uh, potential extra computations. So again, to be able to have an HPC environment um, to, to boost this computation is very important. I mentioned uh, an application in geostatistics, but there are many other potential areas for HPSC, for example, in biostatistics, um, looking at genome-wide association studies or GWAS, or in astrostatistics for gravitational lens modeling, there are many um, there are many problems that are very large scale and would benefit from an HPC framework. What's the future of HPSC? I think it's very bright and I would like to see more interaction between statisticians and supercomputer scientists. For example, by organizing panels and session at conference, conferences, either HPC conferences like this one or at statistics conference, in particular those focused on statistical computing, also by offering a workshop and tutorial or short courses, we, we have offered several times a short course on exaggerate stat for large scale spatial data science. And also by building joint project between HPC and statistician that would be beneficial from both sides. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> well, that's it, thank you. Okay, I think I'm the second uh, speaker in this uh, to be introducing um, my agenda in this uh, panel. And as Mark mentioned, we share uh, a, a university, uh, a new university uh, on the Red Sea, Kaust, and uh, we met each other and he approached HPC from the STAT side and I approached STAT from the HPC side. And I would like to uh, talk a little bit about our motivation for uh, this collaboration and a piece of software that we have been developing. Um, basically, uh, as, as a simulation guy, I've come to see uh, statistics as a good way to uh, leverage simulations. A, instead of doing a large number of simulations while varying the input parameters to develop statistics with respect to uncertain parameters, one can do a relatively smaller number of simulations and then use knowledge about an assumed statistical distribution to fill in and predict missing quantities. So they complement each other extremely well. Uh, spatial statistics can draw from either real data or you know, modeled data coming from large scale simulations, but it trades many large sparse PDE simulations that as we know run typically at a small percentage of peak on a, a typical supercomputer today because of the imbalance of, of data motion and, and flops potential rate. And they transform it to a large dense linear algebra problem, which is smack in the wheelhouse of today's HPC systems as the top 500 shows. Now the bad part about that is uh, that the, these matrices are dense and if they're a million by a million, you know, you have a trillion elements. So one has to do some advanced linear algebra to take advantage of this potential synergism. Why do we care about this uh, at KAUST? Because we are oriented towards many sustainability problems, where to plant what kind of crops based on moisture and sun, where to install wind farms based on wind data, where to install solar photovoltaics based on insulation, how to estimate loads 
of these uh, you know, intermittent renewables. So it's typical today uh, from either advanced models or uh, satellites or other forms of, of uh, measurements to have literally millions of locations. Which brings us back to this famous challenge by the NCAR uh, geostatistician, Dorit Hammerling, who said, you know, we, we now have, we, we now have uh, our, our nirvana. We have millions of measurements, but uh, we lack the, uh, the appropriate tools to take full advantage of them. And if you think about why that is, a million by million dense symmetric double precision matrix uh, has, uh, occupies four terabytes, and to precision. solve it, it's about 10 to the 18th flops. Traditional statistical approaches will um, assume global low rank, for example, or zero outer diagonals to streamline that. But better approaches are to do hierarchical low rank or reduced precision rather than assuming zeros in the outer diagonals. Uh, and uh, just, to, just to set the stage, and I, I won't go through all my slides, I'll leave some for questions, but um, what we're essentially trying to do in uh, max likelihood estimation for spatial statistics is to fit a parameter vector theta for an assumed distribution uh, by, based on this cost function, script L, and the stars of the show are the z, the z vector, say a million by one measurements, and the covariance matrix, which is based on an assumed functional form with these parameters to be fit. So we, we try to uh, minimize or, or maximize actually the negative of this log function in order to uh, fit the parameters. And th that's stage one. And that involves the determinant and the inverse of this large dense covariance matrix, as you can see. In stage two, what we try to do is, is based on some uh, locations where we don't know uh, the, the desired quantities, we have to then uh, apply the inverse of a block of that a covariance matrix to the unknown location uh, vector in order to uh, make that inference. So both the fitting and both the learning, you could say, and the prediction phase involve uh, dense Cholesky factorization uh, or solution. And I think I'll, I'll uh, stop there for the moment and, and come back to uh, maybe some more details depending on audience uh, interest. I can, I can uh, just, just mention that this is now embodied in an open source piece of software, uh, which is uh, masterminded by Sameh Abdullah, who I believe is listening. Uh, it has the maximum likelihood estimator with a variety of linear algebra optimizations. It has the predictor. It has a synthetic data set generator. And best of all, for uh, the, the intended audience, it now has an R interface. So you can sit at an interactive terminal if you have uh, you know, a supercomputer at your disposal and launch these large problems on thousands of nodes uh, and, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, work in a traditional interactive way. So more on that uh, based on questions. Thank you, George. Thank you, David. Uh, our, our next uh, speaker is Norman Matloff. Uh, he's a professor of computer science at UC Davis, uh, where he earlier was a founding member of the UC Davis Statistics Department as well. Uh, Norm, Norm uh, are you? Let ahead. me see if I can get the, uh, uh, here we go. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. So, all right. So, as, as George said, uh, I was a founding member of the STAT department at Davis, and I was also a founding member later of the CS department. Most of my time has been in CS. Uh, my original background is in pure math. Um, you know, the, the first question that I'd like to raise here is, what is statistics? And um, does it include machine learning? And in the, in the CS community, there's, well, even in, in statistics, there's a debate about that. And uh, a lot of stat people would say that much of machine learning boils down to statistics. And a lot of the CS people don't see it that way. Uh, but I would argue that it, it has to, the statistics has to include machine learning. Um, and I'll come back to that. What is supercomputing? Well. Uh, again, you know, we're, there's this question of whether we're talking about Oak Ridge or, um, or something more modest. And I, you know, I think if we're going to uh, involve the stat community, uh, we really have to be more than just something on the Oak Ridge uh, level. Um, 
So here's an example of what statistics. We have a relatively new program here at Davis uh, in cognitive science. Uh, it's become very popular among undergraduates. And uh, I'm on that committee. I'm actually the computer science liaison to that committee. And um, there, there are people from psychology, neurobiology, linguistics, and communications, and some miscellaneous. And I found. You know, these are people that you would think of as traditional statistics users. Uh, in other words, users of traditional statistics. And yet, all of them use SVM. They all do uh, support vector machines. Uh, and I think that surprised a lot of CS people that, you know, you have these people in, in linguistics or psychology that are using SVM, uh, which, you know, is generally recognized as machine learning um, method. So what you have is these people that would probably consider themselves classic users of statistics and yet they're using machine learning. So uh, I, I do think that the definition of statistics has to include machine learning. Uh, many professional statisticians are also using machine learning methods. Um, uh, the stat department here, for example, um, recently, their last few hires, a couple of them at least, have been machine learning people. One of them actually has a PhD in machine learning from a department of that title. Uh, there's another one recently who is involved uh, in the whole question of overfitting in machine learning, uh, neural networks in particular, which is a fascinating area mathematically. And But the point is, here's the stat department doing, uh, doing neural networks. So again, I think we have to include all of that. Um, what is supercomputing? Well, I, again, I have to say that I, I don't think it's just Oak Ridge level stuff. Uh, I would go all the way down to something that uh, uh, you know a serious stat user might have, maybe an eight core machine, maybe uh, maybe a, a, a pretty good GPU. Uh, you know, I'm talking about you know basically um, even George mentioned personal supercomputer. And GPU comes pretty close to that, I, at least in my definition, I would say. And so I think we have to include that when we discuss this kind of thing. If you look at old, you know, uh, you know, old um, uh, offerings of this conference, the same conference, um, uh, I think you'll see that a lot of the work done in those papers is quite applicable to this modest scale that I have in the first bullet or the second. Um, so uh, what's the current status from my point of view? Uh, you know, Gandhi is said to have said about Western civilization, I think it'd be a good idea, <laughs> a wry joke, but I think it applies equally to the situation here. I think interaction between statistics and, and parallel computation communities um, would be a good idea. I don't think it's very common. I mean, we have here, people who do that, uh, certainly George is uh, somebody who epitomizes that, uh, but I think for the most part, um, it, it hasn't happened, and that surprised me. Uh, I was surprised a few years ago uh, when GPU did not become uh, very common in the statistics community. And then you have to ask the question, why not? Uh, you know, there's a little bit, um, Eric Bernstrom, Bernstrom has his uh, future package, which is essentially a, you know, a, a message passing uh, of some sort. Um, but still, he's using, an, you know, his users use this on modest machines, and, and it's not. Again, most people don't; they don't use that kind of thing. Uh, so the potential is there. Uh, you know, the potential in areas that we don't normally think of as. Uh, supercomputer people, or even um, you know, parallel processing people, um, uh, the social sciences, uh, economics. Uh, uh, there's a very good random forest package um, uh, out of Stanford, and um, it's called GRF. And uh, you know, he's talking to the um, the you know the head of that project, Susan Athey, Susan Athey who's a an economist, and she said. Gee, she, she wishes that she had more computing power because it's a great package, but it needs that power. Um, I think we need to have turnkey 
uh, software. It's just got to be something that ordinary statistics people can just plug and play, basically. Um, we need to have something that's much more broad than uh, large-scale linear algebra. I mean, the stuff that we just heard about with the, um, uh, you know, the spatial statistics and, and dense linear algebra, um, that's great. That's classical supercomputing, right? But um, I think we have to do more than that. We have to do more than TensorFlow. And again, on, on modest scale uh, computation. And just to give you a quick example here, uh, also out of Stanford, there's this method for predictor variable selection, foci, um, uh, feature ordering by conditional independence. And um, uh, it's really great. I recommend it if you're, you know, if you do this kind of thing, uh, model free, no tuning parameters, uh, provably consistent. Uh, it's the best that I've seen. And I've been following this for years and years and years and working at it myself. Um, it's not embarrassingly parallel. Um, there is a, a, a main loop there that's easy to parallelize on a shared memory machine, let's say. But you know, what if, if what about clusters? Um, you you know, you could partition the data. That's fine, and you could run the method on each chunk. But then the classic question in that third bullet: How are you going to combine the chunks? And so what you've gotten from each chunk is uh, a vector of uh, of variable indices, how are you going to combine them? And you know the the best predictor set for the big data is not the same as for a chunk. So you might take the union of all the predictor sets from the chunks and um, apply uh, foci to that union and cut it down a little bit. Uh, can we do better? You know, open question. I think I haven't worked too much on it. But the point again at the bottom of that slide is it's not um, it's not a big linear algebra problem, and I think again the supercomputer computing um, community has to take that into account. I mean, not that they never have, but I think that's something that has to be looked at more and more. So basically, that's it. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Norm. Uh, our next uh, introduction is uh, Doug Bichka. He's a professor at the Department of Applied mathematics and statistics at Colorado School of Mines. And he's also affiliated with uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Sciences, NCARO, where for many years he served as director of the Institute for Mathematics Applied to Geosciences. Doug? Hey, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen and jump right in with, with an application uh, let's see here. Let's just do this and lots of stuff. Let me, let me find that file. Yeah. So I, I just want to show you one, one figure and, <clears throat> and talk through a little bit about, um, how, how this particular project is, um, related to my interest in in supercomputing. All right. So can can everybody see this uh, this image? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what we have here is um, is some parameter estimates. Um, these are spatial parameter estimates. Basically the the top are log variants of the field as it varies across North and South America. And the bottom are um, log correlation scales. And uh, <clears throat> this is a this is basically an exploratory analysis problem of some climate model output. Um, what I would like to do with a computer with, with a supercomputer, and and I would describe this first role as bursting, in that I would like to um, <clears throat> have many many cores work on localized areas of, of this image to do these estimates. Now, now what you're looking at are local maximum likelihood estimates of these covariance parameters, um, embarrassingly parallel. Um, if we're doing this in exploratory context, the, the reason I, I, I say bursting is I would just like to get a quick picture of this, take a look at it, pose some models, um, change the model around a little bit, and then go go back and recompute. Um, so the first role here 
is I would like to share the, this supercomputer with say perhaps many other users where you know, at a, at a maximum, maybe I'm just using this for a few minutes and then, and then going away. I should say that my experience at NCAR is I tried to pitch this kind of um, act activity and the, uh, the NCAR supercomputer really wasn't set up to do this. Um, you know, it would take a little bit sort of longer turnaround. Um, the, the other thing I want to talk about in this figure is these two different columns. And th this is another use of, of supercomputing. Um, these maximum likelihood estimates are found the, the good old old-fashioned old way using linear algebra optimization. These estimates are found by basically training a, um, a, a neural network, a, 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 a deep net, um, on many Gaussian process samples um, to, to target the, the true parameters. So what I have here is a, um, a net that's um, taken a little bit of time to construct, but uh, 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 evaluating it locally and sort of running it over this image is, is very fast. Um, so the, the other use of, of supercomputing here is to train, say, something like a deep neural net on a fairly complicated problem like estimating parameters in a spatial covariance, or this could be estimating parameters for an extremal process, which is um, currently um, really not, not computable um, and in, in its exact form. Taking that, that neural net, when, once that's done, that can easily be transported to a laptop or a, a a smaller system to, to, to use for, for data analysis. Okay, so those are the uh, two things I wanted to hit on. This idea of bursting, um, heroic training on a supercomputer to then migrate to smaller machines. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, the next one up is uh, Gina Turasi. She's the director of the National Center for Computational Sciences at the Oak Ridge National Lab, which is the uh, division that includes the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility that's uh, currently the home of Summit and soon the, the home of Frontier. Um, and she's also affiliated with Duke University and the University of Tennessee. Gina? Thank you, George. I assume you can see my slide. Mm -hmm. yes? yes. Yes. All right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, as George said, I'm here wearing the, the hat of the representative for high performance computing. My formal training has been in biomedical informatics. I've been doing artificial intelligence for quite some time. Actually, I joke that I live now the renaissance of AI uh, based on the work I did in the early 90s and then it continued until now. And certainly at the time, um, formal statistical training was a prerequisite for the work we did. So it's very interesting for me to hear this conversation these days about the convergence of statistics and AI. So because I wear the uh, HPC hat for, for this panel. Um, let me give a brief overview of the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility since we have been global leaders in HPC for nearly 30 years. We have been developing, deploying, and operating uh, large scale uh, HPC systems dedicated to open science. Um, this is also a historical time for us because we broke the petascale barrier back in 2009 with a Jaguar supercomputer, and we're about to break the exascale barrier with a Frontier supercomputer, which is currently installed as we speak in our facility. Um, however, the flagship system right now is still Summit, a 200 petaflop system that serves a very broad community of users from academia, industry, other national labs, um, and of course other federal agencies, and a very broad range of applications, uh, both from basic sciences to engineering types of applications. It is certainly interesting to uh, observe how in the past few years we have seen an ever-increasing demand 
for data intensive large scale data analytics, including AI types of applications, in addition to the very traditionally suited modeling and simulation applications. Now, in preparation of this panel, we were given a set of questions um, to frame the conversation. And at a very high level, I, I, I felt that the underlying debate was whether artificial intelligence is a supercomputing problem or it is a statistics problem. And I believe there is a, an argument to be made for both. So let me walk through some you know, opening thoughts for this conversation. The argument for supercomputing. Clearly, um, access to uh, powerful supercomputers super enabled scientists to explore and train faster, ever more complex AI models, leveraging increasingly bigger data sets. Uh, we have seen several examples, even in this year's supercomputing conference, the, the Gordon Bell finalist for the special track is a case where uh, an ORNL team, uh, my ORNL team, has been leveraging large scale language models for drug discovery. So a technology that was developed for natural language processing has been transitioning to so many other applications such as drug, discovering for, dr drug discovery for COVID and other debilitating conditions. In addition, we see applications in which interleaving of modeling and simulation with AI enabled workflows accelerate scientific discovery. Last year, both Gordon Bell winners were examples of that scenario in two different application domains, and we see more applications this year. And these are very interesting workflows because they are well suited to HPC resources. The last point I want to make in, in favor of the argument that AI has uh, has become more and more a supercomputing problem is that processing and analyzing growing volumes of data, supporting heterogeneous workloads and enabling um, distributed training methods all require increasingly more powerful and more capable computing architectures. Now, the argument though for statistics is that no matter how shiny these AI models are, effective deployment of AI models requires deeper understanding of the inner works and the different sources of error. Error that is due to the data, the training data set, to the set where the AI models are deployed, and errors that are due to the training process in terms of initialization of these models, overfitting that was mentioned by a previous uh, speaker. Aspects of reproducibility, robustness, explainability, all of these are deeply statistical issues. Also, uh, the notion of how we distill AI knowledge for more efficient model deployment, something that, again, previous speakers alluded, how we can, when do we need to burst to supercomputing for uh, training of these very elaborate models, but deployment at the edge may look very different because of computing limitations and what is needed at the inference point. So overall, oops. Overall, um, the argument for both, and my conclusion, my thesis, is that in order to advance the field of AI with foundational advances, but also translational impact, we need both. We need the statisticians to work closely with the HPC experts to come together to ensure that we have the more e most efficient and more effective use of the resources, both the compute and data resources. And I would like to highlight the I don't know what's happening. To highlight the one use case uh, that is very close to my heart, uh, a program that I've been working for several years, which is a partnership between the Department of Energy and the National Cancer Institute, that involves the modernization of the National Cancer Surveillance Program, developing essentially AI models that learn to, to read and understand clinical text, and then deploy these tools in the hands of the users who sit at the edge at the different cancer registries. We need the supercomputers to be able to train these models at a very large scale, like language model, uh, language uh, transformers, the language models, which are very compute and data hungry. But at the same time, we need deep statistical understanding to address issues of explainability, uncertainty quantification, because the user needs to know how much to trust the tool for that individual case, the individual patient they deal with. The issue of robustness, because um, uh, class imbalance uh, is very 
prominent in the cancer community. Some cancers are extremely rare, therefore we need to know how much to uh, trust the system for these rare cases, as well as efficiency. And by efficiency, I mean that what we do right now is effectively to train these models or ensembles of AI models um, on at the hub, you know, the supercomputer, but then uh, apply some statistical methods to do knowledge distillation from the models into something that is simpler and easily executable at the edge where typically the computing resources are much more limited. So with that, Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. Uh, our, our next introduction is uh, Rio Yokota. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Global Scientific Information and Computing Center at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And he works with some of the larger supercomputers today. Uh, Rio? Uh, uh, can you play my video or should? Oh, yes, I'm also we can, available. To... We can okay. also do that is, uh, let's see. Is that possible from the AV tech side? Actually, let's see, I can, uh, I think I can do that as well. Okay, and I can share the screen and so we'll do it. Okay, is that, uh, does, can everyone, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, good. But I can't hear the sound. Yep, no volume. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I can just speak while you're showing these <laughs> slides. Oh, so what? Uh, the, <clears throat> what I'm showing. Shall I pause this? What, what is going on? Um, oh, I see. Wait a minute, I need to, I need to mute myself. I think that maybe that's what's going on. No, we, we still can't hear the audio. So I, I think because you have the earbuds, uh, George, maybe, huh? Yeah, that, that could be. But yeah, it, so I, I don't want to take up any um, too much time. So I'll, I'll just, um, yeah, uh, I'll just present with these slides. So uh, the topics shown in these slides were the, the topics that were given to us for discussion in today's panel. And the ones that are colored in red are the ones that I um, want to uh, highlight in, in my introductory um, <clears throat> presentation. And so one is biases in AI systems and the other is rising interest in randomized algorithms. Uh, can, can you go to the second, well, I guess, can you fast forward to, so that it shows the second slide? Is that possible? Maybe I should yes, just share my own slides. Is it? Yeah, that, thanks. So, um, so uh, this is mainly about deep learning and the fact that deep learning has uh, been growing in scale at um, a, a very high rate recently. So the large transformers that you see recently, um, GPT-3, Megatron Turing, these are um, at a scale where you cannot train without supercomputers. And so this is definitely a topic that connects uh, AI and HPC. Um, the, the problem that we are facing now is uh, how we get the data to train such large models. And, um, and also, the, there are a lot of biases in these data that we train our deep neural nets on. 
Um, there, these could be societal biases or statistical biases. And uh, at the moment, I'm working on uh, um, a project where instead of using natural images, like real uh, image pictures, um, we generate um, these images, synthetic images from mathematical formulas, like fractals, or just drawing a bunch of uh, contour lines. Um, and we tried training uh, these vision transformers, um, very large ones, with these synthetic images. And it, it seems to work as well as real images, which uh, opens the possibility um, of removing these biases in AI systems. Also, it removes the copyright uh, or privacy issues that are um, <clears throat> becoming a larger issue in um, real images. And it also, a good thing from the HPC perspective is um, you can actually generate these things on the fly and feed them into the neural networks, which is a huge relief on IO. And so th this could be an interesting way to train these huge models. Um, so I just um, like to bring this up as an issue um, <clears throat> in biases in AI systems. Uh, the next one is about uh, randomized algorithms. And I know that this topic is originally um, about randomized linear algebra algorithms, or like sketching and uh, <clears throat> these low rank approximation methods that can be compressed using randomized uh, compression methods. But uh, here, I, I'd like to touch upon a different type of um, stochasticity that you can find in, uh, again, training deep neural networks. Um, is that uh, the, the stochastic gradient descent, which is um, like the uh, majority of uh, optimizers we use in deep learning frameworks, has um, this random nature to it. And this has a lot of um, benefits because it's very tolerant to noise and errors, but at the same time, it makes it very difficult to debug or um, analyze in a sort of deterministic way. Um, it, and this is something that has been known to lead to better generalization, um, which is, you know, a very important topic in machine learning, but um, how we can actually uh, model um, the stochastic properties of the optimizer, which lead exactly to the generalization that we're seeing is, is still an open area. So. Uh, I thought I would also raise this as a um, an important issue, which is at the intersection of um, statistics and HPC, um, especially when you're dealing with huge uh, deep neural networks. Um, your your optimization process and how you can scale that um, to very large batches while generalizing is um, uh, an issue that has yet to be solved. So uh, I'd like to. Um, close my opening statement with that. And I look forward to discussing with my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Rio. Uh, let me share a set of uh, things that we should address as the panel. And so now we move into open discussion. We have about 35 minutes for that. And uh, so let's see, let me share my screen. Let's see, is that, uh, I need to, okay, I need to stop sharing, sorry. <laughs> it seems that I'm being confused by the actual screen, so if I, There we go. Okay. I can stop this and now I can share screen.
Let's see, is that working or do I need to? Okay. No, wait a minute, this is. I'm waiting for it to show up on. Oh, we, we can see it. You can see it. You, I see. Okay. Can you can you see my share now? Yes. yes. Okay. Very good. So it's working. Uh, so basically, the discussion points are sort of in in three groups here. So first first one uh, is sort of uh, uh, is about why do it, and and a lot of that has already been addressed by by the panel in the opening statements. Uh, the next one is sort of why has it not already happened, in a sense, and finally the the on the right the, the that column is is about what next. And so let's kind of uh, let me open it up to to the panel, and also at the same time let me ask the participants to uh, pose any questions they may have in in the uh, in, in the hub. Uh, application chat for, for post any questions. Okay, so let's uh, let's kind of go go around again. If any if anybody wants to uh, talk specifically, I guess some some of you have already spoken specifically about the benefits to science. Uh, I guess uh, Norm uh, brought it out sort of in general for. Uh, for the social sciences, and that that there are lot, lots of um, uh, techniques that are already in use, and there are large data sets there, um, and several of you spoke about uh, the need for uh, treating uncertainty, for uh, sort of seeing inside the model, so that's interpretability, uh, and so on. Um, well, could I raise a question? Uh, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, one thing that Doug said that really hit me, uh, and it, 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 I also had sort of similar experiences with um, supercomputers at Livermore, is that it, they're, they're just not designed for sort of casual exploratory uh, kind of analysis. Uh, you know. You, um, I don't know what current policy is in most of these places, but you know, I think usually you have to book time in advance. Uh, you know, you feel like the meter is running, and uh, I wonder if anything is being done to to address that. At, I at guess Berkeley, can, can someone they, have, I, um, I, they have multiple yeah. ways of accessing their latest system, which include the traditional batch mode and also an interactive mode. So there are ways of harnessing leading edge supercomputers in either of these two modes, but they are uh, typically different, different partitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. one, th one thing that I've seen is that uh, uh, in, in data analysis, it's a discovery process and you have to iterate a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, 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 mach big machines are very expensive, so the machine can be waiting for you to make up your mind on the next question. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, so they are basically, they're inherently batch. Uh, and interactive computing uh, is uh, highly discouraged, at least on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What we see is compartmentalizing the problem. So if you're going to explore different models you do it in an interactive way but the one final run the one final training of the big model takes place on the supercomputer so at least this is how we are leveraging the computing resources for the one example that i showed you with the doe and ci mm -hmm. um, not every problem is uh, suited to hpc and you need to know when it is the right time to burst over there now, one way, an alternative way is, of course, to expose the batch process to the user via dashboard or a log file. So there are some solutions, but right now that mm -hmm. barrier 
in terms of a smooth integration, I believe still exists. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, um, you know, maybe, maybe one way to finesse this problem is to, is to realize that um, as a statistician, I'm, uh, I'm not interested in hundreds of thousands of cores. Um, if I have an operation where I can just uh, corral a thousand or several thousand cores, all of a sudden um, my data analysis problem, I, I have that kind of speed up in an embarrassingly parallel mm -hmm. situation. And uh, a factor of a thousand speed up in, in exploratory data is incredible. It, it makes you think about doing things that you wouldn't do ordinarily. Um, when I, I think so, you know, I, I wonder if, if, if there's ways of fooling with the, with the batch system on, on supercomputers to say, you know, I'm only going to ask for a thousand cores, but please, when I submit this, I want it to run right away. And I promise it'll only take two minutes. <laughs> um, it seems like there, there could be a slice of the machine that would accommodate that. So absolutely, and this is done already, it depends on what is the mission of the particular supercomputing facility, right? Mm -hmm. At Oak Ridge, we are a capability. So the largest yeah. scale problems will come to us. Right. Uh, therefore, we are tuned to that type of community and those types of problems. But there are other computing facilities, HPC centers out there yeah. that are, you know, capacity computing that are better suited to um, what you described. So right. having an ecosystem that supports all of these flavors, that is what is important for the scientific community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think what yeah. the, the, the fundamental question is, um, we're still thinking about here is the statisticians and here are the AI scientists and how we can bring the communities together earlier on. Um, I applaud all the AI platforms that have been created and that has democratized the use of AI, but it has become incredibly dangerous in terms of developing something that looks accurate, but it is flawed with biases for reasons that Rio uh, described and we deploy it and we don't know why it behaves the way it behaves. That sanity check comes early on from someone who has the discipline, statistical training and understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I was really interested to hear Rio's comment about generating synthetic images because there are nice statistical applications where you basically generate um, data sets and, and, and train the, the, the net on that. And I would argue both, both of these um, help with that generalization issue be, because you're actually controlling the design of the of the training rather than using happenstance images or just a partial space of what you're trying to um, generalize from. So, so yeah, this so is a, a hot topic, the synthetic data generation, and I would have liked to, to hear more from Rio in terms of how you manage the issue of bias because still the synthetic data is generated based on certain assumptions a again coming from the biomedical space right these are not you know general images but i'm thinking about synthetic data for patients if i have only a slice of the population that is not necessarily the most representative that's something that the biomedical community is not ready to embrace mm. easily mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing that's very different from the way we generate these synthetic data um, in the way they traditionally do it, you know, like um, you, you can also generate um, synthetic images using like a JAN, General Adversarial Networks, mm -hmm. uh, which take, you know, you, you still need to train something based on real images for that case, um, and you sort of interpolate between uh, the embedding space to get new images. Uh, but in our case, we don't actually involve anything, any original data. It's just shapes that we generate. Um, of course, there, this this also has some 
biases of its own, but it, it's of a different nature. So it, it, it's sort of a a new space of the problem um, that we are that we need to deal with. The, the surprising thing is that it works quite well, as good as real images, and this is something that we weren't expecting initially. Um, <clears throat> and also to to be a bit more specific about how how we train these things, uh, we actually um, label these synthetic images according to the way the parameters we use to generate them, uh, and it's actually a supervised learning that we use, mm -hmm. e mm -hmm. even though these images don't contain anything we recognize as humans, they, they are trained by artificial labels on artificial images. And so it's sort of, a, a, you know, a, I, a very different a, way of training. Yep. An interesting question is what sort of, what what is a correct artificially generated image? Is there such a concept mm -hmm. of being correct or not correct? It, Yes, uh, so in, the sa in the same sense that uh, sort of early climate simulations uh, produced uh, things that look like weather, but they were not predictions. Yeah, so because there's a lot of freedom in what we generate, um, because it's totally synthetic, we have total control over what we generate as training images. And so there, there could be some feedback from, you know, the loss or we could basically um, back propagate all the way to the data. So th this might be an interesting uh, direction, but we haven't yeah. really done that much in that sense. Uh -huh. uh, there, there's one question that I see on, on well, actually there's several on, on the chat here. Uh, one is what kind of tools and libraries do you as a statistician use? And I guess that's important regarding access. I'd like to take that one on. So I want to say that I, I primarily use R. Um, uh, learning be, being also fluent in, in Python is, has always been second on my list for about four years now. So, um, but, uh, but definitely a, a high level language. Um, in, in terms of packages and libraries, I, I tend to work within the R ecosystem. And so rather than bring, bringing in a, a, a library from outside, I, I tend to just link to an R package that's developed that. Yeah, I am very active in the R community and use R almost exclusively. I mean, I. I I do have a lot of experience with Python, but for data science, I've always argued that R is better. Hmm. But nevertheless, I think the packages that exist are still a problem. Um, hmm. That, uh, you know, especially I mentioned GPU a couple of times, there's still not really good access to GPU from R. And um, I, I'm not sure that that's changing. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. So, for me as well, I mean, I use mostly R. So this is why this software is just that. We have also this uh, this R version that hopefully is a bit easier for statistician to to use. But I think the the nice thing there is that you can specify basically the number of uh, CPUs or GPUs that you have, and it's going to mm. take care of that. Mm. So another question in the chat is, are there any IO bo bottlenecks? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing that I would mention, I, I, I think you know, even getting back to the national supercomputers is, is data storage. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily IO bottleneck in terms of dynamics, but um, um, getting back to access and cost and I would like to know, you know, maybe from from Gina and the others, what what's going on there? I mean, people have data sets so large now that they can't even move it. You know, they put it in the cloud and they can't just move it to another cloud company because, you know, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume that it, you're being charged for all that if you're, um, you know, one of the National Lab Computers uh, users. So what's going on there? So as a national lab user facility, we are free. 
we are available for open science. The allocation programs are competitive in the sense that the PIs submit proposals which are peer reviewed by the external community, both in terms of scientific impact as well as computational readiness. But from the moment the, uh, the PI is awarded the allocation, all of that is free. There is no charge. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying somebody parks their huge data set. Yes, uh, and there is storage. There is storage um, that is allocated to the user. As long as the grant is active. There is no cost from our end. Right, but what I'm saying is, let's say the grant ends. Uh, when the allocation uh, program ends, um, we sustain the the data for some time, but then uh -huh. it, it belongs to the to the user, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah. No, I I, I oh. think there is. Oh, Doug, go ahead. Nor, Norm, I um, and and Gina, I I wanted to just sort of point out on an, another as, aspect of this. So I'm I'm looking at that bullet, HPC brings to statistics. Um, a very simple one is um, certainly for numerical simulations at NCAR, we, we, we had this uh, requirement that the, the data stays on, on the machine. If you want to analyze the data, you do it on, on the machine yeah. essentially or the system basically where it was generated. And, and I see Gina shaking her head yes, here. That's, yeah. That's and, so, you know, statisticians need to get into HPC if only to access these massive um, sim, uh, data sets that are created on, on the supers um, and, and use, use the HPC to, to cut them down into digestible pieces that, that might be analyzed elsewhere. So, um, so yeah, well, would, it, would, it be, would it be fair to say that uh, in, in the statistics community, even among those who, who uh, deal with larger data sets and compute more, uh, uh, knowledge of how to access uh, super supercomputing hardware is is limited. And I and I think uh, one of the things that that we are planning with. Uh, with a few folks is to is to have similar panel sessions in in statistics types of venues and mm -hmm. sort of lay out what is the access process to to the computing resources and uh, uh and it's not just uh, uh so for example oak ridge with the insight process there are sort of lower tiers in a in a sense with smaller machines uh no. that are some some other national labs, but also uh, uh, universities and NSF uh, funded, uh, like the NSF funded Exceed program. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I guess I haven't looked at it very recently, but it used to be really easy to get into. You just have to write a paragraph basically and get, get started. Um, but uh, basically information about access needs to be laid out and perhaps we need to start uh, a community like uh, with, within within statistics. I don't know if it should be a new section, uh, like there is already a statistical computing section that's been there forever, uh, but it really includes almost everybody. It, it, we need another sort of higher tier level in a sense uh, for bigger mm -hmm. machines, high performance, for, for example, high, high performance statistical computing. And that section would have a lot of information, how to access the resources and so on. So uh, I guess what I'm hearing a lot is, is that uh, access and knowledge about access is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is, it's, a, it's basically a sign that the two communities don't really interact that much. Yeah. Agreed. In my opinion, yeah. just about the I think it doesn't really make sense to make a separate section. I mean, it, I think it should be part of uh, the statistical computing section, but just develop there more this aspect of HPC, because I think though the member of that section should have some interest in HPC as well. So yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so just to underscore George, great, great point here. Um, just to underscore that, um, 
some of our, our, our graduate students don't, don't know Unix. And so, you know, you, you throw them on a super and they're, they're starting to learn Unix at, at the same time as dealing with the queuing system and everything else. So, but, but there wouldn't there be a, there would be a pretty strong subgroup within the statistical computing section that is very familiar with Unix and yeah. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps yeah. those will be the first people to, uh, to, yeah. to get interested. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and those would, though, those would be the people that could figure out how to, how to do the training in a way to, to, to make it easy for other, uh, other people to slip in. Um, I, I guess as, as we're uh, uh, sort of one, one other thing from, let's see, uh, from the points, for example, funding challenges, any, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyone wanted to speak to that? Uh, what would be the funding challenges for statisticians uh, proposing to do supercomputing to uh, some funding agencies? I guess uh, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll start it that, that, that I've, I've actually had more success in, uh, in the national, in NS, NSF than, than at DOE that's within the US. I don't know hmm. if others uh, in, in other countries, how, how that works, there are other finding funding agencies. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised I would have thought it would be the opposite, but. Um, well, certainly, and George knows that very well, statistics went through a wave, you know, with the Department of Energy, but I believe the renewed interest in um, more sophisticated AI algorithms and new kind of math, that's the proper way to frame statistical endeavors within the Department of Energy. And okay. I believe that we will see more interest, but that speaks to the same point that unless we bring the HPC experts and the AI scientists and the statisticians together from the beginning to frame the dialogue, we will not move mm. effectively. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, what, what would be the right home for statisticians within uh, say ACM or uh, or IEEE or those kinds of organizations like uh, I guess ACM has a SIG HPC community uh, are there some some I other would, really, it, would, would it be AI focused I don't know you know I think it's a really good question because uh, within CS I mean there's there, I don't think people in CS uh, generally are um, all that anxious to work with stat people. I mean, I, I say that with a foot in both camps, and um, there's a there's there's there, in my with my colleagues in my department. One thing I find is they feel they in CS that they they already know statistics and they you don't have to collaborate. Mm -hmm. So um, that you know that's sort of a different aspect here but it's one that I, I observe constantly and so the the all the arguments of r versus python for example often boil down to statistics versus cs and so I, that there's stuff going on there that I, I think really ought to be addressed and it's not healthy so do you think that the low entry point would be foundational activity or applications <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, 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 it's a problem I've thought about for a long, long time, and I, I'm, I have to confess, I don't, I don't see. I, I was just telling, um, I was in a department meeting the other day, and I was saying, you know, really, we need to, we in CS need to reach out more to the stat department, and um, everybody said, oh, yeah, 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 and <laughs> let, let's see if it happens. I mean, I, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not waiting with bated breath. Yeah. I think um, I, I would go on the application side. 
Um, I agree. Yeah, what what I you know one one model I see is um, there's a really compelling application, not not just posted machine learning data sets that everybody uses for comparisons, but you know like your cancer surveillance and um, pair, pair that with some machine learning proposals. And I think the statisticians will rise to the challenge. They'll either say, man, this machine learning algorithm works amazing, I wonder why. Or, or they'll say, you know, you can, you can try this statistical model and it's comparable and it's more interpretable. So, you know, I think good, good things will come out of that one way or, or another. And, and, of, and of course you have the application as the final, final goal. So that will keep everybody honest. Um, but, I mean, you know, I agree with that, but for example, one of my colleagues in CS uh, just uh, got a five-year grant uh, with uh, multiple departments on campus um, uh, on using AI in, in food science, which I think was an interesting idea. But as far as I know, he didn't include anybody from statistics in there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I mean, even machine learning, you know, you have two terms in, in, in statistics, you have statistical learning. And I've, I've never understood what that even means. But, uh, I, you know, the bridges ought to be made here, ought to be built. And, um, you know, maybe applications is the way to start, but they, people, have, people have to want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree that applications is the path. Uh, and I do believe an important um, flip, cultural flip that we all need to, to have is that when we come together to discuss these applications, it's not a, comp it's not a competition between supercomputing mm. and statistics, because I think we all come to the table defensive, right? <laughs> and I've seen that in the specific application I talked about, because on one hand, you know, if, if deep learning has gained so much attention because it has achieved high levels of performance with lower manual lift, right? Mm -hmm. Traditional machine learning is great in biomedical applications and it achieves great level of performance, but it requires so much feature engineering from experts that it is, uh, we can afford compute cycles more easily than experts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where that defense, you know, it, it is not a competition. It's how we can find the synergies. And I agree, the synergies will come out from trying to understand why these models w work the way they were, work. What is the uncertainty quantification? That is the holy grail for me as the initial, you know, entry point. Yeah. Because we still rely on traditional statistical methods to develop UQ and articulate UQ to the user. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, in defense of statistics, I have to say again that there are a lot of people in statistics these days who are looking very, very closely and doing amazing work in opening the black box of neural networks. Um, you know, why? The, asking the question why they work when they do, uh, why does overfitting work? Mm -hmm. You know, there's this notion of double descent um, you may be familiar with, uh, which is amazing. And it's only in the last few years. And there are people both in stat departments and CS and, and math for that matter that are, are working on this. They, they have extremely sophisticated mathematical frameworks to work from, but they are cooperating at least for that. So we're, we're, we're sort of going back and forth between machine learning and statistical learning and, you know, really all of these are, are sophisticated, you know, I, I would, from my experience at, at NCAR and um, running climate models, the, uh, the, the way the model output is probed is actually very very rudimentary because it's done by climate scientists who maybe have one or two stack courses in their grad grad course. So you know one opportunity here um, for a HPC is is to get 
is to get the stack community and I would say the machine learning community um, to the to these large simulations and actually do something a little bit more sophisticated than just means and standard deviations and <laughs> typical plots. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Actually, I've heard uh, climate scientists say what you just said, uh, but about 20 years ago, and <laughs> and, I, and it sounds like it's still uh, still in the same place. Yeah, yeah, and it 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 has to do with with the culture that a climate scientist's interest is to build more processes into the model, not to evaluate it in more sophisticated ways. So. Um. Okay, so we're pretty close to the end here. Uh, I guess the main thing: what are what are the next steps here? What's what what should this uh, what what should be the next steps to achieve uh, such a community? You already mentioned some things, but uh, uh, one one of them was. Uh, basically informing a subset of the statistics community about the opportunities and and uh, I guess that's that's one place what about on on the HPC side uh, what uh, are there any next steps to to involve more of the statistics community in in some of what's going on I think having a GPU backend for R would seem like a good start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, uh -huh. it, it, it shouldn't be that difficult to do. They did, they did it for Python. They do it for uh, you know many other high level languages. So it, it should be possible. Well, so some, you, some, some of that exists actually in for, for some dense linear algebra. Right. Right, for specialized problems it's there, but I mean, I, you know, the GPU CUDA is not a high level language. It's low level. You have to exploit the architecture. And I think mapping from R is uh, in, in, in anything more than just very, you know, nicely set out linear algebra is, uh, is a challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I think personally just wanted to, to add that I think this type of panel should also happen in statistics conferences because right. probably the audience to, to this conference and this panel is mostly HPC mm -hmm. uh, right. people. So I think it should appear also in the, in the other side yeah. and having, I mean, kind of a sessions also at the, I mean, where we have technical talks at the intersection of HPC and, and statistics or short courses on both sides, I think are, are ideas to further pursue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would welcome any suggestions, ideas about training events that our super facility, you know, leadership computing facility could prepare for, um, you know, tailored to the statisticians, to that audience at different mm -hmm. level, because we, we have different training events. So we could um, create modules and events to support the statisticians as another entry point for these conversations. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that sounds good. Yeah. So we are uh, near near the end here. It is six o'clock. Uh, well, uh, it's six o'clock Eastern. It is five o'clock uh, Central, and uh, I guess uh, th uh, three o'clock, uh, three a.m. Saudi Arabia time. I think, or no, two, no, uh, two a.m. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we'll, uh, we will, we're, some of us are planning to write up some of this and, uh, and put it together and, and we're planning some more events within the statistics community. And we'll also uh, figure out how to reach out to have training events uh, yeah. that are specific for that. And mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, thank you all uh, for participating. We didn't quite get to all the questions in uh, in the chat. Uh, I will see if I can uh, answer some of them, or if you if you if you think uh, someone else can look in there as well. Uh, but uh, so thank you all and. Uh, this concludes the panel session. Hmm. Thanks, George. Thank you, yeah. George. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. Thank you, George. Bye-bye. Thank
拜拜。